Welcome. So this lecture is about historical ciphers and let's jump right in with the probably most famous historical cipher due to uh, Julius Caesar who used it to communicate with his troops. So he was trying to hide the information of what his strategy was and so when he was sending text in his letters he wasn't sending them in plain text like the normal text but he was encrypting them so he was changing the letter in each cipher a plain text by a letter in a cipher text in such an easy way well i've shown here two rows of the letters in our current alphabet so 26 letters and he was just shifting them by a few characters so that a stood over d b over e c over f and so on and so then encryption was taking the letter on the top row and encrypting it with a letter on the bottom row so if you're having hello bob then you're looking with the letter H is in the top row and you're finding under it that it's letter K. Then you're looking up E, uh -huh, E is over here, so then you're finding E encrypts to H. So hello Bob turns into H, uh, K H O O R space E R E. And of course he shouldn't leave spaces because that gives away information as well, but let me make it a little bit simpler on this slide. Now decryption, um, well the encryption goes reading downwards, then for the decryption you have to map to the upper one. So you're seeing a letter in the bottom row, that's the encrypted ciphertext, and then you're changing it to the letters in the top row. So you can take a moment now and pause the video and figure out what this text uh, corresponds to. The other very famous cipher uh, encryption system is the substitution cipher, and you will have probably seen this in like news magazines or uh, kids books so it's just taking um, each letter and replacing it by a symbol and so here's another example where well you can still see the spaces so i'm making it easy for you and so this is another exercise where you should be able to figure out what the cipher text is i mean what plain text corresponds to the cipher text um, i have a hint for you so you can look for short words and you can also look for repetitions like combinations of letters that you see in multiple rows and maybe with with spaces around it in certain ways and then you know it is a text in English that I use and that should be enough to figure out what the plain text was. Now in the first lecture I was highlighting the importance of keys and so you might wonder where are the keys here. So the second example is called the substitution cipher and in this case the key is the knowledge of the full alphabet. So when I was encrypting it, I knew for each letter what it maps to as a symbol, and the person decrypting it would know for each symbol what it, what letter it corresponds to. Here's an example. So A corresponds to the star, and oh, well, I just gave an exercise, and now I'm giving this away. Well, if you flip back, the only thing that you're learning is that the text I gave you does not actually contain an A. Um, because it's not a Caesar cipher, it's not just the shift, this is actually giving you some information, uh, not giving you any other information for the other symbols. Now for the Caesar cipher, the way I presented it here, the, the way it's historically described, doesn't have any key. So when you know the system, you know everything. But it's also very easy to turn the Caesar cipher into a cipher which has a key. We call this a, a keyed cipher. So let's start with a, with a base state. So here we're having the same alphabet, but now written in concentric circles. And I'm thinking of this as the outer circle encrypting to the inner circle, well, and vice versa. So when you're decrypting, you're going outwards, that was the uh, bottom up, and when you're encrypting, you're going inwards, that was the top down. And then what Caesar is doing corresponds to mapping A to D, well, that's just shifted by three letters. So he's shifting counterclockwise, and then the A maps to D instead of just to A. So if then you want to map 17 further, well, can't, 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 can't shift, um, that means you're mapping A to R. And so now you actually have a key, so Alice and Bob, when they want to communicate with this, they both should know how far they have shifted it. Also, since we have had some background in mathematics, and in general it's easy to teach a computer what to do with numbers, um, I would translate A into 0, 0, B into 0, 1, and so on, and then this computation with the shifts is just addition of integers more than 26. So if I say, okay, I'm shifting by 17, that means I'm adding 17 to each number. 
And so if I would be starting with say 24 up there, then 24 maps to 15 because 24 plus 17 is 41, which is 15 larger, larger than 26. Another important question when you're looking at the security of a system is how many keys are there? What is the key space like? What is the possibilities for an attacker to search through to get the key? Now on Caesar, well, you have the base state situation and then you have 25 more shifts. So there are only 26 keys for Caesar and one of them is even the identity map. So it's very easy to try, uh, at least if you have a computer, and you just test all of these texts and probably only one of them will give anything sensible. So if you know that this was some human readable test, text, then you will just try all of those and you'll get your answer. If it was a password, which could have been a random set of characters, then you don't have the information that it was something reasonable, but it also tells you there are only 26 different possibilities. So if you have 26 password guesses, this is also a very weak system. In principle, the substitution cipher, even if you fix the set of symbols, you're having a lot of possibilities. For the first letter, for A, I have 26 different letters, as different 26 different characters, pictures that I can relate this to. Well, I pick this one. I pick the star. So for B, then I have the remaining 25. For C, I have the remaining 24. So this gives 26 factorial, which is a pretty large number. So that's 10 to the 26 different keys. This is in the range where a supercomputer can do it. This is also in the range where some of the crypto systems are that, well, are luckily no longer so commonly in use, but it's not so long ago that we considered this hard to break. So it does take some time. So I mentioned already the word key space. So the set from which the keys are drawn is called the key space. So when you're looking at the security of a system, then a minimum requirement is that this key space is large. It should be too large to search. So having something like 26, that is absolutely no go. Having 10 to the 26 is still not good, but at least if this was the only attack, it would actually be a system that we could be using. It would be inconvenient because you have to have the full set of pictures. But I remember when I was a kid, um, one of the stores which was selling um, pencils, they had this pencil where you would have the secret alphabet and then it would show you what A and B, what character, what pictures they correspond to. And then a friend of mine and I bought matching pencils and so we had your secret uh, encryption. Of course you could never use these pencils because once you shorten them you're losing A and then losing B and so on. But well it is possible to put a set of alphabet characters on a pencil. So it's not impossible to use. But you would have guessed already or you know already that this is not the only way to attack this. So if you're looking at analysis of these, if you have a sufficiently long text, so if my friend and I would be sending long letters with our secret alphabet, which is mapping A to star and so on, then what it gives it away is that this is natural language. And natural language is not uniformly distributed. So here I put um, the frequency distribution of letters in the English language and so you see a very strong peak at E, and you're also seeing peaks, well, the next highest is T, then A, then O, then I, and N. I mean, the neighboring ones are not too much lower, but this is the, if you put them next to each other, they stack up like this. Now, if you're looking, if you know that your encryption is done with Caesar, then you would just look for this pattern of peaks. For instance, the N and O are both very frequent or the H and I are both very frequent. And then there's this three prongs at the RST. So that's another thing to look for. And of course, there's a huge P and they should have the correct distances. And so even if somebody gives you a slightly skewed text, which is about zoology or something, which is having Z, which is otherwise rather uncommon, um, it would still peak, get the peaks for the other letters at the right places. And so you would very quickly figure out what Caesar is. If you have a substitution cipher, then this will also point to, well, which symbol could be an E or which symbol could be an A, which symbol could be a T. And then you would be trying those. And then of course you're filling in the other characters to make those things proper English words. And you're finding like combinations like and or A as a single character or the, those things are very, very common. 
looking at more secure systems. So the one-time pad is strongly put out as a poster child of something which is absolutely secure and very, very unusable. So it's of course important to, to highlight this here as a possible encryption system. So let's assume you have a key which is as long as the message you want to send. In practice, that means, well, you don't know yet how long your message is going to be. So you're going to have a very, 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 very long key. And then when you start sending messages, you're using the first L symbols of the key and using the L if your message has L the symbol. So in this case, I'm going for bits because in the mathematics is easier to explain, but I'll also go into normal characters in a moment. So when you're then using the first L pieces because your message has L bits, then you would be stopping here. You would rip off this piece of the one-time pad, you burn it or whatever you do with, with one-time pads, and then you go for the next one. Actually, at some point I was in the spy museum um, in Western Germany where they were showing what they had caught from an Eastern German spy. And it was pretty impressive. So like these are the stories of spycraft. So it was a, a coat hanger with very strong shoulder pieces. And it turned out that in the shoulder pieces there was a flap which you could open and inside was a spool, like a little thing of paper like this. And on this paper were a string of zeros and ones. And so or maybe it was actually letters. I don't remember the exact details, but this was a one-time pad that this spy was using to send messages home. And then at the end, you rip off the paper and you burn it. Um, encryption, well, let's do the, the bit case first. This is just taking each position of the message and the ciphertext uh, and the key and adding them modulature. So if you prefer mathematical notations, these are vectors of length L over the binary field F2. And then see the ciphertext is just the sum of m and k of the two vectors. And if you prefer talking about bit strings, well, then you're writing these bit strings on top of each other. And for each position, you're computing the XOR. So the one-time pad is information theoretically secure. That means that the ciphertext does not give any information about the plain text. Well, let's work this out. So if you see a zero in your ciphertext, then a zero is either coming from zero plus zero or it's coming from one plus one. So depending on what the key bit was, you're getting a unique message back. So that's why it can decrypt. But as the attacker where I don't know what the key bit was, I have no information whether this zero that I'm seeing in the ciphertext actually came from message bit being zero or came from message bit being one. Similarly, if I'm seeing ciphertext equal to one, well, 1 is 0 plus 1 or 1 plus 0. So also there, both plain texts are equally likely. Now this is assuming that the key is chosen uniformly at random, that every position has made a coin flip between 0 and 1 and there are no biases. Um, I said already that the key has to be as long as a message, so you must never reuse this pad. So it's not a two-time pad if you don't have enough one-time pad. That will be insecure and I'm going to go into this in the next lecture. So for most situations, if you're not in the business of spycraft or if you're not securing the, the red phone between uh, Moscow and Washington, this is not the crypto for you. Now historically, uh, this has been used um, where the key was not uniformly at random, it was not bit strings, but you would agree on a book and then you would be taking pages from the book and taking the letters as your key. And well, if it's a very long book, which is common, say you would pick the Bible, which you would expect to find everywhere. Expert note, make sure to figure out which version of the Bible you're using because there are differences. But assuming that you and your spycraft friend have agreed on exactly the same copy and it's something sufficiently common to carry around, then nobody would assume that this was the key. Then you're just taking your key, for instance, this is a story of Little Red, so on. And then these letters, well, in the one-time pad with bits, we're indicating an addition. What we're indicating here with a T is that we're doing Caesar shifted so that A maps the T. So if I have my alphabet A, B, C, D till Z, then the first character of the key being T means I'm shifting the bottom alphabet so that the first letter is a T, second letter is a U, and so on. So if I then want to use this to encrypt Hello Bob, 
then I'm looking where the H is going and H here goes to A. All right, so this means in mathematical terms, it would again be simple to write this model 26, means that H plus T is equal to A. Meaning H encrypted under the Caesar cipher, which maps A to T, maps H to A. Well, let's look at the next letter. So the E gets decrypted with Caesar mapping A to H. So if you're mapping A to H, well, here's a different shift of the alphabet, then E maps to L. One last one. So the, this is, the next letter is an I. So we're shifting the bottom alphabet so that A maps to I. And then the letter L in Hello Bob uh, encrypts to T. This is pretty good against your common attacker who doesn't even know which book you're having and so on. But it's not really secure because you're not having a uniform distribution on the key. Now you're having, again, the distribution of, say, English letters on your key. And so an encryption with the Caesar cipher, which maps A to E, is a lot more likely than encryption of a Caesar cipher, which maps A to Z. And so you will see peaks with that. But OK, this is a lot more secure than the Caesar cipher or the substitution cipher. The last thing I want to cover is basically some middle ground. So it's a system due to Visionaire, um, where instead of having a long key, you're having a short key. So it's not a whole story in a book. You just agree on a code word, say crypto. And then you're doing the same thing as in the one-time pack that I just described or with the book cipher, where you're taking this code word written next to each other, repeated over and over and over again. So this way you're making your key as long as any message. So if you now want to encrypt, this is the better way to encrypt than Caesar, then you're writing as many copies of crypto as fit under it. Okay, so this one has crypto, crypto, so on. And so then um, crypto has six letters. So the first letter, the seventh letter, the 13th letter, and the 19th letter, and so on. So everything which is one mod six is encrypted. Well, the bottom, the second row, the keyword starts with C. So that means we're using Caesar with the rule that we're encrypting A to C. And so then in this case, we're looking at, well, what are the letters here? We want to encrypt a T. So T maps to V. Okay, that's the first one there. The next one is an A. A maps to C. So we're putting a C there. And so you see all of these letters appearing. Now, this is certainly more convenient than using a book cipher where you have to agree on the book and you have to remember how far you went. You shouldn't reuse the book cipher either. I mean, then you're back to Visionaire with a longer keyword. Um, so this one, crypto, you can remember and you know how to do it. You have your, say in this case, six different copies of your alphabet six shifts sitting around or you have your the, the two discs that I have you can actually buy as little turning discs and you can always move your ciphering uh, discs around to get the right settings but is it secure now let's assume that you know that my keyword has six characters then on every sixth character like the regular space dashes up there I'm using just the same Caesar encryption so if I'm focusing on letter 1, 7, 13, 19, and it's a sufficiently long text, then those letters should have the normal frequency distribution of English. I can't stop by just saying, oh, I try all 26 shifts and one of them will make sense. But I can see which has the right frequency distribution. So I can have my guess for, well, okay, this one has a high peak here and then there is a now, this could be the NO peak and the IH peak, so this is probably the right shift. And so I throw the computer at this, I do frequency analysis on every one, on every kth letter, and I'll have to do the same for the letter 2, K plus 2, 2K plus 2, and so on for the next shifting distance and so on. So I have to do K such a text, but if the text is sufficient long, I will very likely get very nicely uh, clear frequency patterns, and else it's just the futurized. 
The second method I'm showing for unknown k for that one also will help with the, with the normal Caesar cipher, so let me cover this one first. Um, you can also look for repeating groups. Now in my text I don't have too many repetitions, but you see a this and you see a then. And now I got slightly unlucky as an attacker because the this, the th, is encrypted with cr and the then as encrypted with ry. But just imagine that the text goes on with the keyword just being six characters, you have a one in six chance that your next time using the or this or then, the th would be actually nicely aligned with the cr. And so when you're looking for repeating combinations of letters, that is another way to figure out what would be a likely candidate for, say, the THs. And so that also helps in the first case. Now in the second case, if you don't even know what the key length is, there's the kind of mindless approach of just throwing computer power at it. And okay, you know it's visionaire, so it will have at least two letters. So you're doing frequency analysis on the first, third, fifth, and so on letter, and you're looking for peaks. Then you're doing the same with three and looking for peaks. Now two and three are divisors of it, of six. So you will see some peak pattern, but the E will have two places on this because crypto is twice the length or three times the length for two. So then you're seeing this peak slightly smeared out. If you're looking for length five, it will be a total mess. So you very easily exclude five. Four is again, so it's not co prime to six, so you might see some commonalities, but once you get to six, aha, you got the right one. Alternatively, you're looking for these very common repetitions like this, the, and, or something like this, and when you're seeing these same ciphertext symbols together repeatedly, you assume, ah, maybe these were the same plaintext symbols and they are aligned with how the keyword happens. So if the crypto would be aligned with a th, well, this would happen at a multiple of the length of the keyword. So you would be seeing like these repetitions after 36 characters and you find another repetition after 54 and then you're looking at, okay, what is the GCD between those numbers? What is a number that would be both a factor of 24 and of 54, let's say, or 36 and 54 again? So then you're thinking, aha, probably the keyword has length 6. And so you're zooming in, you don't do a brute force approach on all of those, you're only testing a few. Of course, this can't distinguish between 6 or divisors of 6. So if you're seeing distances which are multiples of six, it could still be that keyword has only three or two characters. But if you're assuming it has six, you will find out that you have a repetition. So if it's actually three and you're starting with six, then well, okay, you're doing too much work, but you are gonna get CRY, CRY, for instance. So you would still get the right keywords. All right, so that's all I wanted to say today about the historical ciphers. Thank you for your attention.